Chapter 30 We're a solemn crowd for the next few days. There's no joie in our joie, joie de vivre. Dad and the rest of my Minnesota family start to help pack my things. It's time for me to leave. Summer is almost over. School will begin soon. Dad and Judy are discussing a possible last-minute trip to get our minds off what happened. As if I can think of anything else. I spent a lot of time in my mother's bedroom that last day, just wanting to absorb everything before I leave. Grandpa, or Grandma and Grandpa, already said we could come back for Christmas. I asked if I could stay next summer, too. Of course, Bear tried to get in on that action. Actually, I might let him. He's starting to grow on me. But there's one thing I still don't understand as I lie here on the bed. Across the room, on the dresser, are five little things arranged in a line. The things that someone gave me. Warnings or gifts. First, it was a jar of dirt. Then it was a small bag of wild sage. Next to that are the remaining presents. A feather, some June berries. And finally, I add the last object. A little plastic toy turtle. All of these are remnants of my turtle mountain time. I must be in a daze because I don't even hear my dad come in. He sits on the bed next to me. Apple, sweetie, it's time to go. Are you ready? I look up to him. Where did those lines come from next to his eyes? Has he always had gray at his temples? Dad, I guess I'm ready, but... But what? He gently fingers my necklace. I'm so glad to see you wearing that. It was your mother's. Did you know that? Somehow I knew that without him even telling me. Staring at the top of the dresser, I say, But Dad, I don't understand why someone gave me these things. Dad gets up and walks over to look at my catch of gifts. He leans against the doorway, grabs the jar of dirt, and twists the lid off. Carefully, he pours some of the contents into his palm. My dad squeezes the soil, letting it stay formed in a clump. Next, he takes out the sage crumbles it gently in his hands, and brings it to his face while he inhales its fragrant scent. I watch my father do what seems like, what seems the most mundane thing. He is ever the medical man, investigating the mystery before him. Back in Minnesota, watching my dad, the doctor, sort out his medical cases has always been a fascination of mine. If you looked at him close enough, you were able to read his face while he debated against himself between the correct diagnosis and, in turn, the best path for treatment. Dad always incorporated all of his senses. That's it. My head jerks up from the bed. Dad, I've got it. I know what this means. I get why I got these things, and I know who gave them to me. Dad's eyes glimmer a bit as he says, enlighten me. I look up to see everyone crowded around the bedroom door now. Judy and my grandparents. Okay, so I have a loud voice. There could be worse things in life. The dirt, I say, looking at everyone now in the room. Oh, Dad, it was Nezzy. It was her all along, not Carl or Raph. And it wasn't just a weird childish whim. These were never threats. They were gifts. This is the dirt. The soil. The feel of the turtle mountains. Next, the sage. It is the smell, the scent of the reservation. Grandma is smiling. Apple, I think you're onto something. Pacing back to the bed and around to the open window, I can hear the ever present song of the birds out in the backyard and the feather. It sounds of it up here. The June berries, the taste of up here, the sweet taste of life up here. In fact, it's my favorite taste, and little Nancy knew that. Dad picks up a little toy turtle and rubs its shell, and this stands for the name of the Turtle Mountains. Grinning ear to ear, I answer, nope, but close. It's the look of the land up here. The first thing I noticed driving up here was the change of the land, and how it started sloping into gentle hills. Nancy gave me this little gift. I take the turtle from Dad because the land up here 
looks like turtle shells underneath the grass. Back and forth, I look at my dad and Judy and my grandparents. I'm not seeing the light bulbs going off in their heads yet. Growing up these days. Okay, stay with me, you guys. Nezzy gave me what she already had. She knew that eventually I'd have to go back to Minnesota, so she made me a little care package, Nezzy style. I can't take all the relatives back with me, and I can't take the Turtle Mountains with me. So she gave me something up here for every one of my senses to remember it by. Taste, June berries, touch, earth, ear, bird feather, smell, sage, and look, turtle. Grandpa pats my head. Well, I'd say you got that just about right. It's, it's the nicest gift anyone has ever given me. My voice cracks at the thought of such a wise gift from such a tiny girl. Like they say, and a little child shall lead them. And lead me she did in defining where I came from, which I desperately need in order to find out where I'm going in life. I'm not happy about leaving, but I know that one's life must move forward. The thing that still bothers me was one of the last things Nezzy asked me the night before she died. What's with the gold in gate? Nobody seems to understand what that means either. My bags are packed, and I'm ready to go this morning. Everyone is outside waiting to leave. Taking everything in as I walk around the house, I breathe in the scent of Grandma's house. It seems like one part apple pie, one part laundry detergent, and a sprinkle of coffee. But to me, it's the sweet smell of family. On the front porch, Junior, Auntie Ober, Berta, and my grandparents are hugging and saying their goodbyes. The rest of the Minnesota clan makes its way to the car while I force myself one step at a time to leave the place where I finally found myself. Dad decides right away this morning that we all definitely need a quick vacation, me, Bear, Judy, and Dad. We need time, he says, to rest. Sounds good to me, but it'll take more than a vacation to heal my heart. First, we need to say our goodbyes. Turning to Auntie, I say, thank you so much for helping me with the dream interpretation. Waving her arm, Auntie replies, eh, bah. Just make sure you practice making bang at home. You're all too skinny. Junior grabs me into a bear hug and lifts me off the ground. You'll be okay. I was worried about you, city girl, but now I know. We made an Indian out of you. An odd one, but one that no one will ever forget. He adds a wink. Eh, hey, bah, Junior. We didn't make her an Indian. She just got to find it inside of her. Grandma to the rescue. Wrapping me in her arms, she kisses me on both cheeks and whispers, My girl, we love you. Remember that I'm just a phone call away if you need anything. Christmas vacation will be here before you know it. She hands... Her hands gently cut my face as she gazes into my eyes one more time. Lucian finds fixing the railing on the deck. I know he's waiting until everyone moves to the car to say his goodbye to me. Apple, my girl, you are just a joy in my heart now. I'm going to miss you. Who's going to get up and eat with me so early in the morning? Kissing me on the forehead, he continues. Now you do well in school. Make us proud. Try to figure out what you were meant to do in this life, Grandpa says. We must ask, what was I created to do? What was I meant to do to contribute? And, Apple, be good to your dad and Judy. They love you, too. Judy says to me as I step into the car, Do you want front or back? Winking at Grandpa, I answer, Hmm? Oh, no thanks. I don't like yak. He smiles and winks back. We pull out of the driveway and I can barely look back. In only a short few months, I've made a lifetime of experiences. I got to hold, I got to know a whole new family, learned about my Indian side, figured out the meaning of my crazy questions, met Carl and Raph and took a short nap down under, finally met my mom, and made and lost my best friend. 
I'd say I have a boatload of things to write about when school starts and teachers assign the good old essay, what you do over summer vacation. I force myself to look over my shoulder as Dad starts driving away. Everyone is in the driveway waving. Everyone in the car but me is waving back. I roll the window down. There was already snowing right. I can see Berta as she slips her hand into Junior's. They're quite a sight to be seen. Humpty Dumpty and Skinny Minnie. Well, I guess that just goes to show there's a Jack for every Jill, isn't it? I wonder if I'll find the salt to my pepper, the pie to my apple. He kisses the top of her head when I hear him yelling. Dig a whopping in. See you again. A surge of emotions well in me as I yell back and wave like a mad woman. Dig a whopping in. Yes, I'll see you again my family, but I'll never say goodbye. Languages tell a lot about a culture, and the fact that language, that the language of my relatives has no word for goodbye means that I'll never be alone again. In this life or the next, I will be with them all. The Land Rover makes its way down the street and out of Morinville, North Dakota. I know in my head we have to leave, but my heart is desperate to say, Dad turns on the radio to fill the silent car. With my iPod on as loud as I can crank, I lean my head against the window and watch the, bent, the gentle sloping turtleback hills pass me by. As we round the curve to catch the highway south, I notice the sign, that sign. I have to twist to look back out the window, but there next to the welcome to, to the Turtle Mountain sign is Carl. It's the same spot where little Nezzy died, trying to make our world nicer. I can't be sure, but it looks like one of his sons is there, too. It's Raph, the one from that day at the cemetery, the one who always had the green spray paint. Dad, can you please, um, pull over? I need to do something. Did Bear puke already? No, quickly, Dad, I have to wrap up some loose ends. Carl looks up for a split second and catches my eye. He nods solemnly. Judy starts to protest as she sees who was on the side of the road, but my dad puts his hand on hers and pats it. As the car slows to a stop, I dig around in my purse and find it. I wrap my, my hands around it and step out of the car, holding on to the door, trying to, for balance, trying to balance my soul. Carl, I... No, stop. Don't. Carl stammers while shaking his head gently back and forth. I look and notice he and Raph are planting flowers around the sign. Here, I whisper, holding the object out to him as a peace offering. Across the chasm of forgiveness. Oh, you didn't. You didn't need, but I did. Take it, and he takes, he takes, grabs the tape, that tape, the next tape he made for my mom with Barry Manilow Love Sons. It has flowery drawings all over it. Carl grabs it a bit too harshly, then adds, Sorry, I... Carl stares at me, but instead of rage covering his eyes, he looks at me with a somber face and gently wipes the cassette tape with his fingers and places it in his front pocket. These flowers, I hope Nezzy would have... I reach out in the pain of... I reach out across the pain of 20 years. I catch his hand. She would have loved them. And my mom, too. He opens his mouth, but only air came out. We have nothing more to say, except one thing. Carl, Raph, there's one more thing. My name is Apple, and I don't give a rip if some people, some ignorant people, I emphasize looking at Raph, choose to see something ugly in it. One boy tried to take away my Indian half a long time ago by calling me a nasty name. But you know what? I am an apple. On the outside, I may seem tough, but the broken. But when broken, there's a sweetness in my soul. I may not be Indian the way you are, or anyone else's for that matter, but I am Indian. I'm a Turtle Mountain Ojibwe, and no one will ever take that away from me again. Looking back as I step into the car, I watch Carl as he turns back to his son and cuffs him across the head. They return to the flower pot planting around the base of the sign. Nezzy's sign. 
And I also notice that there's no graffiti on it either. It's a small start, I guess. But Carl and his boy need to make sure they beautify their insides too.